First, I should like to say that I'm a gamer. If that sounds like a confession, it was. It, it wasn't that uh, long ago, I would never have said that in public. Um, but it turns out, well, um, well, Call of Duty Black Ops 2 made $500 million in 24 hours. The original made $650 million in 24 hours. Halo 4 made $220 million. And I realize it can't be just me responsible for a $16 billion a year industry. There's got to be at least three other people out there doing this. <laughs> about two, a week or so before I spoke at the annual Stale Conference, I found this article about what video games are good for outside of just playing games. And they came up with this nine list. Now, I, I agree with them. I think they're all valid. I, some are better than others. I think helping stroke victims fully recover might be a little bit better than having Call of Duty improve your eyesight. A little bit there. But I, I can't help feeling that some of this is missing the point. There is buried here something more important than just, you know, finding out that reaction times are improved as you play Prince of Persia, which, by the way, I actually showed in my classroom. It's kind of like saying, you should take senior biology because the textbook is really, really heavy. And carrying around will actually work your triceps. It's beside the point. Now, what you don't hear about a lot, and you have to be a gamer to understand this, you actually don't have fun all the time. In fact, there is a lot of stuff you do when you're playing games that is drudgery. But as my students say, it's drudgery that's still more engaging than what we, they do in class. And they've actually referred to school under the terms low resolution, or they have to power down when they come to my class, which that was really embarrassing, <laughs> or just refer to school in general as SD. And they don't mean the little cars, they mean as opposed to HD. I found digging into this a few years ago when I was doing research into how science, well, the scientific method, I hate using air quotes, but I'm gonna use it for the scientific method, because there isn't one. There are many scientific methods. But in looking how the scientific method is portrayed in textbooks, um, I was doing a lot of research, I was actually going through textbooks line by line, and you, you have no idea how much fun that is. So I would, I would relax by playing video games. And it would be me against the entire Nazi Third Reich, or an entire covenant of aliens. And as I was playing, something started nagging at the back of my brain, something that was there that wasn't really coming forward and, until a little bit later. And I realized, oh my God, I'm actually using science while playing. And I thought, that was amazing, that's new stuff, I should write a book. It was already written. James Paul G. wrote it in 2005, called Video Games and Learning. Um, another book by Jay McGonigal came out about, called Reality is Broken, and talks about how games can make life better for everybody. And uh, Stephen Johnson, who wrote Everything Bad is Good for You. Those three books basically stole my thunder. But I still realized that there was something I could learn about this and incorporate into my own classroom. Now, I'm not saying I use games in my classroom. Not in the classic sense. What uh, Doug and Matthew did, that's amazing. And I'd love to be able to get away with that in my classroom. Uh, but when you teach uh, senior physics or senior biology or senior chemistry, parents don't want to hear that you're playing games in the classroom. Because how is this going to help them get to university? Because after all, that's the important thing, right? What happens after is beside the point, but just get them there. So I was looking at the principle behind games. What is it that games have that lets them do this wonderful thing where they can make $16 billion a year. And it is important, it is, oops, was I, back yeah, is the process of gamification. They are able to take the principles and apply them outside games. Now you know this is serious because there's money involved. And corporations have taken this and created all sorts of gamification principles and apps that use gamification in which they sort of hide the marketing in the game. 
or the app uses the game to do, make you do something that ordinarily you wouldn't do. You, we already mentioned earlier about uh, the Happiness Project, where you saw the, the, the piano stairs. Well, that is gamification. I don't know if you've heard of Zombie Attack, the iOS. That, well, what it is basically is an app that you, you, you play while you're running, and if you slow down, you hear zombies behind you. <laughs> and it's brilliant. You know, it's number 935 uh, on my list of, damn, I wish I thought that. Yeah. <laughs> so what games are really going, uh, really good at, and what I want to talk about is, first of all, what they are, or what the principles part of them that I'm going to talk about, and how we can use them for engagement, how we can use them for motivation, and how we can use them to get kids to accept a certain level of complexity. Because I think we've gone the other direction in education. We've actually oversimplified things to the point that it's, well, just plain boring. What is a game? Well, this is the, the classic definition of a game, the technical definition. It's my favorite definition. I agree with it. That's why it's my favorite. But there's three aspects of this that I think are the most important. That's this. And this is what I want to incorporate into my lessons, well, into my assignments, and my projects, and so on. Now, they're not that far from what we do. Every assignment does have a goal. Every assignment should have rules. And as a teacher, I have to provide feedback. It's how we do this that I think is very different in games than what we've done traditionally in, say, in science education. Now, what, good, what games are really good at is abstracting complex scenarios into a form that's a little bit more graspable. Consider chess. Chess is, if nothing else, an abstraction of warfare. You are a general. You have limited resources, and those limited resources have limited mobility. Within that context, you have to make the other side admit defeat. And that probably brings me to my second and third counterintuitive feature about games. One, unnecessary or arbitrary rules, obstacles. What is the reason for a knight moving in an L shape in chess. Does anybody know? Or a rook going vertically or horizontally? Or the queen going wherever the hell she wants? <laughs> there may have been good reasons for this. I don't know what they are. But they're just arbitrary now. But even with that nature, that arbitrary nature, you still play the game. The second point, failure, well that comes from playing chess with my father, who would win 99% of the time. Irritatingly so, that after you got to the point where you'd give up, and you go, you give up? I go, yeah, he turned the board around and play as me and win again. <laughs> failure, spectacular failure, is also motivator. I, what I mean by spectacular failure, by the way, chess failure was not spectacular. That was just failure. But when you play video games, you fail spectacularly. You know, if they really wanted to do a simulation inside a game, when you got shot, and by the way, gamers here, how many times have you died in a game? Who counts, right? Like thousands, thousands, thousands. Okay? If you want to do it, I guess, realistically, it would just go black, right? No. They show you slow motion, <laughs> falling, <laughs> you know, really graceful or crumpling, and you just sit there, ooh. My son, who's five, uh, we play Wii together. It is embarrassing how good he's getting at five at beating me and Wii. Uh, except for one game where we, we just basically fly around and the idea is to collect balloons, you know, and you know, if you really want, you can shoot the other guy's balloons and you have to collect more balloons. He is frustrating to play with because he likes to dive. And dive because when he hits the ground or hits the water, he pops up in a, in a parachute. That's spectacular failure. <laughs> that keeps you going. And that's missing, because failure in education is summative. And that word is not supposed to be used that way, but that's why I'm using it. <laughs> it is the end. And what we want is failure to be the process. We saw earlier a slide in which we had success this way, failure that way. I think you have, you have to go through failure to get to success. It's the town. There's multiple towns of failure on the road to the city of success. I'm going to put that on a t-shirt one day. <laughs> so, 
if we are, in video games that is, if we are not having fun all the time, if we are failing, why does this happen so often? This is from Stephen Johnson's book, Everything Bad is Good for You. Obviously, games have managed to trigger something in our brains that keep us coming back, even in the face of difficulty, drudgery, failure. We, I'd love to have people around me that always got up after falling down as often as I had to get up from falling down in a video game. Because that is, that is the kind of person I want to be. That's the kind of people I want my students to be. So I looked at that and went, what is it that games are doing? And again, as I said, as I was playing the games, something kept coming up there, and it's like, OK. And it came to me finally while playing a game called The Knights of the Old Republic. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's a Star Wars game. takes place thousands of years before the, uh, the Star Wars movies and so on, and are better than the movies. You wake up alone with no memory in a room. And somehow, you got to figure out what's going on. So you probe your environment. You click on things. You look here. You see what happens. The environment responds in a certain way. And based on that, you form a hypothesis. You test it by you know, clicking and pointing and moving around. And if it works, great. You keep going. So it's, I call it the probe hypothesis interact Reprobe cycle, or fear. Fear is a great motivator. That's also a t-shirt, but you know, I'm working on it. So based on these assumptions, based on these hypotheses, you actually get feedback. And in the course of, well, in the case it was, it was a weekend of about 50 hours, I finished the game. And I realized that games basically use the scientific method to keep you engaged. They trigger something in our brains. They actually are able to keep you going for hours and hours and hours at a time. I'm not kidding. I spent 50 hours playing the, the Knights of the Old Republic straight over one weekend. No girlfriend, no wife. Not, this is a long, long time ago. <laughs> Can't do that anymore. And with that insight, I realized what else that the games gave me was this idea of a really great context, a story. Are you familiar with the parable of the cathedral? If you are, it doesn't matter, I'm gonna say it anyway. <laughs> this this uh, parable has multiple versions. It's often used in marketing and business meetings, but those are not my favorite. This is my favorite version. A, um, a traveler passing through shot during the building of the cathedral walked past a man who was hammering some wood together and he asked him, what are you doing? He says, I'm creating a scaffold you know, to use to build the wall. And he passed by a stonemason and he said, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm uh, carving this stone so it will fit with the other stones in this wall. And he passed an old woman who had a straw broom and was sweeping up the debris and asked her what she was doing and she said, I'm building a cathedral. And it's that context the idea that big picture that is missing from what we do in science. And by big picture, I mean going beyond the curriculum. I mean taking what's in the curriculum, because we have to. When I started teaching, we had guidelines. You know, I started in 1990, and everything had the word draft on it. And there were curriculum guidelines. The guideline is no longer there. This is what we have to do. So although I'd love to have games in my classroom, I have to make sure this stuff gets covered. And as the head, I have to make sure other people have it covered too. So I needed another way to approach this. And one of the things I did was start looking at how do I know my students are engaged? Like I'm looking out at you. How do I know you're engaged? You're looking at me, fine. Some of you are probably thinking about lunch. Okay, more than a few of you are thinking about lunch. You're making eye contact. Some of you are nodding. Some of you are making notes. Some of you are playing Flappy Bird. Doesn't matter. <laughs> How do I know I get my students engaged? Well, we saw engagement in the video when Doug and Matthew saw that the kids, you know they're engaged. 
You didn't have to have a definition, you didn't have to have a checklist. They're engaged. So, what games do? They tap into our reward circuitry. That scientific method, which is basically a way we humans have a way of interpreting and, and interacting with the world around us, is important to us. And when we get into something new, and we get rewards, and by rewards, I don't mean points, I don't mean badges, I mean mental, aha, I was right about that. And let's face it, as, um, I mean, as a man, I know when I'm being right about something, that's important for me. I don't often get to you know, be right since I got married. Um, games also do something that other lessons in science, well, other education don't do. We, we tend to science give a lot of information up at, up, and, up at once. There you go. Here's a whole bunch of stuff. And it doesn't matter, biology, chemistry, physics. You know, this is, this is the equation you need for dynamics. This is how you figure out how long something's going to take to fall down. This is the parts of the cell. This is, um, this is in, an organic chemistry equation. We give them a whole bunch of information, and then we say, okay, here, do something with it. And the kids go, oh, okay. Games do it the best awkward. They withhold information. They tell you nothing until you're ready for it. And then they give you just enough to keep you going. If they gave too much too, too soon, the game, the game becomes boring. And it becomes basically like a lesson. I think this is probably why when um, people try to come up with edutainment games, they're failures because they try to make the lesson as part of the game. So, in a game you desire to see the next thing. It's like a good book. It's a page turner. You want to know what's going to happen next. Except in a game, you are the maker of what's going to happen next. Your choice determines what's going to happen next. Your interpretation is important. That active nature is different from what students get in a standard class. And I wanted to change that around. I want to give them assignments that, instead of being the have-to-dos that we heard about, they should be the get-to-dos that they actually have to do. <laughs> you can't have everything. So, if we're teaching things the other way around, what would it look like? What would it look like for me to withhold information until they needed it? It's kind of scary even as a teacher to do that. My students turned out weren't that scary. And in fact, it was by talking to my students, and I tend to do that a lot, talk to them. You know, it's important. Uh, in fact, this is unusual where I'm talking to a room and it's silent. Nobody's challenged me on anything. That's, that's unusual. Because usually I got a few small, smart alecks in the class that actually challenge me something. They come up with little statements. They come up with some, some ideas. And at first, it'd be kind of irritating. But after a few years of this, or 18, you know, it, uh, it becomes part of the repertoire. In fact, by listening to them, I realized they had the answer of how to do this. Now, to do this, you need time, you need choice. So you have to give them an assignment in which they have some kind of choice. Most often, what I tend to do is give them choice in format. Some kids are great at video, some kids are great at writing, some kids are drawing. Mine is an art school. So we have a lot of drama people. We have a lot of dancers, too. And they keep asking, can we do a dance? Well, I have a rubric, because this is Ontario, so everything's got a rubric. You know, if you can meet the rubric, give me dance. Nobody's really done that yet, but I'm hoping. But the, the drama, that's amazing. I get, I get people volunteering to do presentations. If you're a teacher, how many times do you get students volunteering to do presentations? Anybody hands up? Yeah, I get, like, I get these, oh, well, can, can I do something in front of the class? Really? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't happen that often. What happens more often than not is I'd give them assignments and so on, it was boring. It's demotivating. You know, give me a paper on how, uh, let's say, eukaryotic gene uh, work. Yeah, that sounds good. 
And they'll Google it, sometimes from their, their chairs, and they go, okay, here we go. You know, Wikipedia article thrown in there for good measure. And they'll tell me everything that I already knew about how genes work. Boring. But, I listened to my class one day, and I had a kid at the back, smart kid, and they're usually the smart kids, but it's a bit of an attitude, you know, and uh, we're talking about this new thing we just heard about called epigenetics. Have you, have you heard of epigenetics? Epigenetics essentially means on top of genetics, and it has to do with the fact that we used to think that, you know, okay, fine, your genes get passed on, but there's nothing you can do to your body that would affect the genes getting passed on. That's still true, but it turns out that what you do to your body can affect whether or not certain genes are turned on or off in the next generation. Now that's fascinating stuff. And the idea being that if your grandparents suffered a famine, that might lead to a higher probability of you having diabetes. Or that grandchildren of Holocaust survivors tended to have a higher than average percentage of cortisol, the stress hormone, in their bodies. And one of the students said, yeah, does that mean I can sue my grandparents because they took heroin and it made me you know, get ADD? That's an interesting idea. And now they actually, when I say things like that, they actually get nervous. Because I created an assignment based on that statement. Big context. And I made it as complicated as possible. By complicated and complex, I don't mean Rube Goldberg complex, where you try to take a simple thing and you make it as, as, as multiple steps as possible, but I mean, you, you, we have a backstory, we had a name, you know, we had this person, he was from, uh, I forget, we actually came up with a name, I can't remember it right now, uh, but he's from, from uh, Quebec City, and he was suing his grandparents because his grandmother had been a heroin addict at the age of 19, and his grandfather had been an alcoholic since the age of 14, and he claims that this abuse of their bodies led to him having epigenetic tags that caused him to have Asperger's and the inability to keep down a job. Now that is, that is pretty big, that's epic. It's, we, we call rhythm rich assessment tasks, which spells rat. I prefer epic. <laughs> epic projects. Epic from Jane McGonagall's book, because epic is what you get in games. You're, you know, if you play Call of Duty, I'm against the entire Third Reich. And let's face it, the other non-player characters, the other computer, they're not that good. It's just me. <laughs> That's epic. So this was an epic project. And to add another layer on top of it, I didn't ask them to write a report. I asked them to be, pretend they were the lawyers arguing in front of the Supreme Court of Canada for or against this case. That was their choice. You can't Google this. Go ahead, find Wikipedia entries on this. It's not going to happen. They had to actually do the work. And then, because I have art students, they wanted to portray it in the classroom. You know, they wanted to inherit the wind in the classroom. And it was like, oh, I did this. <laughs> you know, and you keep pinching yourself, this is going to work. Another time, another student, well, a different student, talking about evolution, and again, sometimes not the most interesting of topics and so on, and we were talking about how even though a Chihuahua and a Great Dane are so different in size, they're still the same species. And a student in the back asked, so that means if they, if they bred, you can have a Great Wawa? Yes, yes, technically that's what you call it. And then he said, and we domesticate, they came from wolves, right? Yeah. Too bad we can't domesticate disease the same way. That's an interesting idea. Uh-oh. So how would you do that? How would you take cholera and turn it into a cold? We've pretty much done that with a flu, haven't we? So they had to pick a disease and figure out some mechanism of converting that pathogenic organism into a less pathogenic organism. But again, it's not about a paper, it's not about Wikipedia, it's not about Google. They had to do it in the form of a, a research professor trying to get government grants to actually do this research. 
And now my final bit then is talk about identity. That last little bit, that gave them the, their identity. And sometimes your ego is what gets in the way of doing a good job. If you're a student who believes, I don't do science, that stops you. But if it's not you, if it's the lawyer arguing in front of the Supreme Court, or if it's the professor trying to say, it's good for you to give me a lot of money to do this, they remove you from that. Just like when I'm playing Halo, I am the Master Chief. Now, I know I'm not really the Master Chief, but there is a relationship there, even with a fictional character, because I'm determining what that character does. And between giving them a realistic goal, really interesting context, and getting their egos out of the way, those are the game principles that I try to put into my assignments. And I'm trying to produce in my students people that are not afraid of complexity, that understand that it's not just about the curriculum, there's something else out there. Thank you, thank you ladies and gentlemen.